Chapter 3, Prosecution of Civil Action, Rule 111 Implied Institution of the Civil Action with the Criminal Action Number 1. When a criminal action is instituted, the civil action for the recovery of the civil liability arising from the offense charged shall be deemed instituted with the criminal action, Section 1A, Rule 111. The reason for the implied institution of the criminal action is the principle that every person criminally liable for a felony is also civilly liable. Generally, a criminal case has two aspects, the civil and the criminal. The civil aspect is based on the principle that every person criminally liable is also civilly liable. Under Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code, every person criminally liable for a felony is also civilly liable except in the instances when no actual damage results from an offense, such as espionage, violation of neutrality, flight to an enemy country, and crime against popular representation, Cruz versus Mina. Number 2. A separate civil action would only prove to be costly, burdensome, and time-consuming for both parties and further delay the final disposition of the case. The multiplicity of suits must be avoided. With the implied institution of the civil action in the criminal action, the two actions are merged into one composite proceeding, with the criminal action predominating the civil, Ricars versus Court of Appeals. The civil action, in which the offended party is the plaintiff and the accused is the defendant is deemed instituted with the criminal action unless the offended party waives the civil action or reserves the right to institute it separately or institutes the civil action prior to the criminal action. The law allows the merger of the criminal and the civil actions to avoid multiplicity of suits. Thus, when the state succeeds in prosecuting the offense, the offended party benefits from such result and is able to collect the damages awarded to him, heirs of Sarah Marie Palma Burgos versus Court of Appeals. Number 3. The rule on implied institution of the civil action does not apply before the filing of the criminal action or information. Hence, it was ruled in one case that when there is no criminal case yet against the respondents as when the ombudsman is still in the process of finding probable cause to prosecute the respondent, the rule that a civil action is deemed instituted along with the criminal action unless the offended party, a, waives the civil action, b, reserves the right to institute it separately, or, c, institutes the civil action prior to the criminal action, is not applicable, ABS CBN Broadcasting. Corporation vs. Ombudsman Purposes of the Criminal and Civil Actions The prime purpose of the criminal action is to punish the offender in order to deter him and others from committing the same or similar offense, to isolate him from society, reform, and rehabilitate him or, in general, to maintain social order. On the other hand, the sole purpose of the civil action is for the resolution, reparation, or indemnification of the private offended party for the damage or injury he sustained by reason of the delictual or felonious act of the accused. The sole purpose of the civil action is for the resolution, reparation, or indemnification of the private offended party for the damage or injury he sustained by reason of the delictual or felonious act of the accused, Ricars v. Court of Appeals. Judgment of conviction includes a judgment on the civil liability. Because of the rule that the civil action is impliedly instituted with the criminal action, the trial court should, in case of conviction, state the civil liability or damages caused by the wrongful act or omission to be recovered from the accused by the offended party, if there is any and if the filing of the civil action has not been reserved, previously instituted, or waived, Hunt Young Park v. Ian Wong Choi. Who the real parties in interest are in the civil aspect of the case. The real parties in interest in the civil aspect of a decision are the offended party and the accused. Hence, either the offended party or the accused may appeal the civil aspect of the judgment despite the acquittal of the accused. The public prosecutor generally has no interest in appealing the civil aspect of a decision acquitting the accused. The acquittal ends his work. The case is terminated as far as he is concerned, Han Hyung Park vs. Ian Wong Choi. Rule applicable. One of the issues in a criminal case being the civil liability of the accused arising from the crime, the governing law is the rules of criminal procedure, not the rules of civil procedure which pertains to a civil action arising from the initiatory pleading that gives rise to the suit, Han Hyung Park vs. Ian Wong Choi. When a civil action may proceed independently, independent civil actions and quasi delicts, bar 2005. Number 1. The 2000 Rules of Criminal Procedure has clarified what civil actions are deemed instituted in a criminal prosecution. Under the rules, only the civil liability of the accused arising from the crime charged is deemed included in a criminal action. Thus, the civil actions referred to in Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code shall remain separate, distinct and independent of any criminal prosecution which may be based on the same act, Philippine Rabbit Bus Lines Incorporated vs. People. Thus, if the employee-slash-driver of a common carrier, by his negligent act causes serious injuries to a pedestrian, the former is not only civilly liable as a result of the felonious act, reckless imprudence resulting to serious physical injuries, but is likewise liable under a quasi delict or culpa aquiliana pursuant to Article 2176 of the Civil Code. Such civil liability even if resulting from the same negligent act is separate and independent of the crime. Number 2. 
Another possible legal basis for the institution of a civil action against the driver separate from the civil action flowing from the offense is Article 33 of the Civil Code. Because the act of the driver has caused physical injuries, a civil action for damages entirely separate and distinct from the criminal act, may be brought by the offended party. Such civil action shall proceed independently of the criminal prosecution, and shall require only a preponderance of evidence, Article 33, Civil Code. Number 3. By the clear terms of Article 2177 of the Civil Code, the responsibility arising from a quasi-delict is entirely separate and distinct from the civil liability arising from negligence under the Penal Code. The same rule in Article 2177 of the Civil Code finds support from Article 31 of the same Code, thus. When the civil action is based on an obligation not arising from the act or omission complained of as a felony, such civil action may proceed independently of the criminal proceedings and regardless of the results of the latter. Article 2176 arises from a source of obligation distinct from a crime while Articles 32, 33, and 34 of the Civil Code are sources of obligations arising from direct provisions of law. The civil actions arising from these articles do not arise from the acts or omissions constituting a felony hence, are not impliedly instituted with the criminal action. Only the civil action to recover the civil liability flowing from or arising from the offense charged is impliedly instituted with the criminal action. Number 4. The civil actions arising from Articles 2176, 32, 33, and 34 of the Civil Code may be filed independently and separately from the criminal action because they do not arise from the offense charged. What the law proscribes is double recovery. Article 2177 of the Civil Code declares that the plaintiff cannot recover damages twice for the same act or omission of the defendant. The same prohibition on double recovery is reiterated in the Rules of Court, Section 3, Rule 100, and 11, thus. In no case however, may the offended party recover damages twice for the same act or omission charged in the criminal action. Number 5. A criminal case based on defamation, fraud, or physical injuries gives rise to an independent civil action arising not from the crime charged but from Article 33 even if caused by the very same defamatory or fraudulent act. This civil action is also distinct from the civil action which is the consequence of the alleged criminal act. The same principle applies to all those actions based on Articles 32, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code which may arise from the very same act that gave rise to the crime. Consequences of the independent character of actions under Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code. The following are some of the consequences of the separate and distinct character of civil actions arising not from the offense charged but from Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code. Number 1. The right to bring the civil action shall proceed independently of the criminal action, Section 3, Rule 100, and 11, and regardless of the results of the latter, Article 31, Civil Code. Bar 2005. Number 2. The quantum of evidence required is preponderance of evidence, Section 3, Rule 100, and 11. Number 3. A. The right to bring the foregoing actions based on the civil code need not be reserved in the criminal prosecution, since they are not deemed included therein. B. The institution or the waiver of the right to file a separate civil action arising from the crime charge does not extinguish the right to bring an independent civil action. c. Even if a civil action is filed separately, the ex delicto civil liability in the criminal prosecution remains, and the offended party may subject to the control of the prosecutor still intervene in the criminal action, in order to protect the remaining civil interest therein, see also Philippine Rabbit Bus Lines Inc. versus People. When there is no implied institution of the civil action. Number 1. There is no implied institution of the civil action to recover civil liability arising from the offense charged in any of the following instances. a. When the offended party waives the civil action. b. When the offended party reserves the right to institute the civil action separately, or c. When the offended party institutes the civil action prior to the criminal action, Section 1a, Rule 111. The above rule has no application to independent civil actions under Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code. Number 2. When a criminal action is instituted, the civil action for the recovery of civil liability arising from the offense charged shall be deemed instituted with the criminal action. Hence, it is correct to argue that there being no reservation, waiver, nor prior institution of the civil aspect of the criminal case, it follows that the civil case arising from grave threats is deemed instituted with the criminal action and, hence, the private prosecutor may rightfully intervene to prosecute the civil aspect, Cruz v. Mina. Reservation of the Civil Action. If the offended party desires to reserve the right to institute the civil action after the criminal action has been instituted, the reservation shall be made before the prosecution starts presenting its evidence. The reservation is to be made under circumstances that would afford the offended party a reasonable opportunity to make such reservation, Section LA, Rule 111. No reservation of the civil action in BP 22, 
Bar 2001, 2002. Number 1. While the rule allows the offended party to reserve the right to institute the civil action, such right does not apply to a prosecution of a criminal action for violation of BP 22, which is the law on bouncing checks. The criminal action in this case shall be deemed to include the corresponding civil action. No reservation to file such civil action separately shall be allowed. Upon the filing of the joint and civil actions, the offended party shall pay in full the filing fees based on the amount of the check involved. This amount shall also be considered as the actual damages claimed, Section LB, Rule 111. It should be observed that what the rule prohibits is the filing of a reservation to file the civil action arising from BP 22. It does not prohibit the waiver of the civil action or the institution of the civil action prior to the criminal action. Number 2. Even under the amended rules, a separate proceeding for the recovery of civil liability in cases of violation of BP 22 is allowed when the civil case is filed ahead of the criminal case, Low Bunchen v. Balboa. Quoting the earlier case of Hyatt Industrial Manufacturing Corp. v. Asia Dynamic Electrics Corporation the court noted in Low Bunchen, this rule Rule 111, b, of the 2000 revised rules of criminal procedure was enacted to help declog court dockets which are filled with BP 22 cases as creditors actually use the courts as collectors. Because ordinarily no filing fee is charged in criminal cases for actual damages, the payee uses the intimidating effect of a criminal charge to collect his credit grabs and sometimes, upon being paid, the trial court is not even informed thereof. The inclusion of the civil action in the criminal case is expected to significantly lower the number of cases filed before the courts for collection based on dishonor checks. It is also expected to expedite the disposition of these cases. Instead of instituting two separate cases, one for criminal and another for civil, only a single suit shall be filed and tried. It should be stressed that the policy laid down by the rules is to discourage the separate filing of the civil action. The rules even prohibit the reservation of a separate civil action, which means that one can no longer file a separate civil case after the criminal complaint is filed in court. The only instance when separate proceedings are allowed is when the civil action is filed ahead of the criminal case. Even then, the rules encourage the consolidation of the civil and criminal cases. We have previously observed that a separate civil action for the purpose of recovering the amount of the dishonor checks would only prove to be costly, burdensome, and time-consuming for both parties and would further delay the final disposition of the case. This multiplicity of suits must be avoided. Where petitioners' rights may be fully adjudicated in the proceedings before the trial court, resort to a separate action to recover civil liability is clearly unwarranted. When the separate civil action is suspended. Number 1. After the criminal action is commenced, the separate civil action arising therefrom cannot be instituted until final judgment has been entered in the criminal action, Section 2, Rule 111. The rule indicates that preference is given to the resolution of the criminal action. Number 2. It is submitted that even if the right to institute the civil action separately has been reserved, the separate civil action cannot however, be instituted until final judgment has been entered in the criminal action previously instituted. Also, if the civil action was commenced before the institution of the criminal action, the civil action shall be suspended in whatever stage it may be found before judgment on the merits, once the criminal action is filed. The suspension shall last until final judgment is rendered in the criminal action, Section 2, Rule 111. This rule however, does not apply to independent civil actions discussed earlier and covers only civil actions arising from the offense charged. Consolidation of the civil action with the criminal action. Number 1. It is clear that the above rule, as it stands, gives precedence to the resolution of the criminal action and will necessarily result in a delay in the disposition of the civil action which may have been already filed or of the action the right to the filing of which has been reserved. However, the rule also affords a remedy to avoid such a delay. The offended party may move for the consolidation of the civil action with the criminal action in the court trying the criminal action. The motion for consolidation by the offended party is to be filed before judgment on the merits is rendered in the civil action. The consolidated criminal and civil actions shall be tried and decided jointly, Section 2, Rule 111. Number 2. If the civil action was commenced ahead of the criminal action and evidence had already been adduced in the civil action even before the institution of the criminal action, the evidence so adduced shall be deemed automatically reproduced in the criminal action without prejudice to the right to cross-examine the witnesses presented by the offended party in the criminal case. The consolidation shall not likewise prejudice the right of the parties to present additional evidence, Section 2, Rule 111. Suspension of the period of prescription. Where there is no consolidation of the civil action with the criminal action and the civil action is suspended or the civil action cannot be instituted separately until after final judgment is rendered in the criminal action, the prescriptive period of the civil action shall be told during the pendency of the criminal action, Section 2, Rule 111. When no reservation is required, when civil action is not suspended. Number 1. When the act constituting a crime is at the same time a violation of Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code, there is no need to reserve the filing of a separate civil action. 
The civil actions under the said articles do not arise from the offense but from violations of specific provisions of the civil code. Specific attention need be given to the tenor of Section 1 of Rule 111. Under said rule, only the civil action arising from the offense charged shall be deemed instituted with the criminal action. Actions based on Articles 32, 33, and 34 arise from the law and are commonly called independent civil actions while those based on Article 2176 arise from quasi-delicts. They do not arise from the offense or crime charged and hence, are not deemed instituted with the filing of the criminal action. Article 1156 of the Civil Code considers law and quasi-delicts as sources of obligation separate and distinct from a crime, acts or omissions punished by law. Under Article 31 of the Civil Code, when the civil action is based on an obligation not arising from the act or omission complained of as a felony, such civil action may proceed independently of the criminal proceedings and regardless of the result of the latter. Number 2. Article 31 of the Civil Code is reinforced by the rules of court, thus. In the cases provided in Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code of the Philippines, the independent civil action may be brought by the offended party. It shall proceed independently of the criminal action. In no case, however, may the offended party recover damages twice for the same act or omission charged in the criminal action, Section 3, Rule 111. To reiterate, under Section 1 of Rule 111, what is deemed instituted with the criminal action is only the action to recover civil liability arising from the offense charged. Actions under Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code may be filed separately and prosecuted independently even without any reservation in the criminal action. The failure to make a reservation in the criminal action is not a waiver of the right to file a separate and independent civil action based on these articles of the Civil Code, K. Supinen v. Laroya, 388 SCRA 28. In a subsequent case, the Supreme Court further held that what is deemed instituted in every criminal prosecution is the civil liability arising from the crime or delict per esse, civil liability ex delicto, but not those liabilities arising from quasi-delicts, contracts or quasi-contracts, Philippine Rabbit Bus Lines v. People. Number 3. Article 31 of the Civil Code as well as Section 3 of Rule 111 of the Rules of Court both support the conclusion that the civil actions based on Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code of the Philippines are not suspended by the commencement of the criminal action because they may proceed independently of the criminal proceedings. Subscribe for more audiobook like this. Counterclaim, Crossclaim, Third-Party Claim in a Criminal Action Number 1. A court cannot entertain counterclaims, cross-claims and third-party complaints in the criminal action. A criminal case is not the proper proceedings to determine the private complainant's civil liability. A court trying a criminal case is limited to determining the guilt of the accused, and if proper, to determine his civil liability. It cannot award damages in favor of the accused, Mackay v. Nobella, 454 SCRA 504. Number 2. The rule is explicit. No counterclaim, cross-claim or third-party complaint may be filed by the accused in the criminal case, but any cause of action which could have been the subject thereof may be litigated in a separate civil action, Section LA, Rule 111. Rules on Filing Fees Filing fees apply when damages are being claimed by the offended party. The following summarizes the rule on filing fees. A. There are no filing fees required for actual damages claimed, Section LA, Rule 111, unless required by the rules. Examples, in BP 22 cases, the filing fees shall be paid based on the amount of the check and shall be paid in full, Section LB, Rule 111, in Estefa cases, the filing fees shall be paid based on the amount involved, Section 21A, AM. Number April 2, 04. B, filing fees shall be paid by the offended party upon the filing of the criminal action in court where he seeks for the enforcement of the civil liability of the accused by way of moral, nominal, temperate, or exemplary damages but other than actual damages, and where the amount of such damages is specified in the complaint or information. If the amount is not specified in the complaint or information but, any of the damages is subsequently awarded, the filing fees assessed in accordance with the rules, shall constitute a first lien on the judgment awarding such damages, Section LA, Rule 111. Effect of death of the accused on the civil action. Number 1. If the accused dies after arraignment and during the pendency of the criminal action, the civil liability of the accused arising from the crime is extinguished but the independent civil actions mentioned in Section 3 of Rule 111 and civil liabilities arising from other sources of obligation may be continued against the estate or legal representative of the accused after proper substitution or against the estate as the case may be. The heirs of the accused may be substituted for the deceased without requiring the appointment of an executor or administrator and the court may appoint a guardian ad litem for the minor heirs, Section 4, Rule 111. The court shall forthwith order the legal representative or representatives to appear and be substituted within a period of 30, 30, days from notice, 
Section 4, Rule 111. Number 2. If the accused dies before arraignment, the case shall be dismissed but the offended party may file the proper civil action against the estate of the deceased. Section 4, Rule 111. Number 3. The court in ABS-CBN Broadcasting Corporation v. Ombudsman, on the basis of existing jurisprudence like People v. Beatas, reiterated some rules which may be summarized as follows. A. The death of the accused prior to final judgment terminates his criminal liability and only the civil liability directly arising from and based solely on the offense committed, i.e., civil liability ex delicto in senso strictio re. But the claim for civil liability predicated on a source of obligation other than a delict survives notwithstanding the death of the accused. This source of obligation may be from law, contract, quasi-contract, or quasi-delict. In other words, the civil liability based solely on the criminal action is the one that is extinguished. B. Where the civil liability survives, an action for recovery therefore may be pursued but only by way of filing a separate civil action. The separate civil action may be enforced either against the executor slash administrator or the estate of the accused, depending on the source of obligation upon which the same is based, ABS-CBN Broadcasting Corporation v. Ombudsman. Number 4. The death of the accused during the pendency of his appeal with the Supreme Court totally extinguished his criminal liability. Such extinction is based on Article 89 of the Revised Penal Code. The death of the accused likewise extinguished the civil liability that was based exclusively on the crime for which the accused was convicted i.e., ex delicto, because no final judgment of conviction was yet rendered by the time of his death. Only civil liability predicated on a source of obligation other than the delict survived the death of the accused, which the offended party can recover by means of a separate civil action, people of the Philippines v. Spring is Buni y Damat. Thus, the death of the accused pending appeal of his conviction extinguishes his criminal liability and the civil liability based solely thereon, People v. Jamie Iacic y Tolly. Novation, Extinguishment of Criminal Liability. It is best to emphasize that novation is not one of the grounds prescribed by the revised penal code for the extinguishment of criminal liability. In La Catina of Cases, it was ruled that criminal liability for Estefa is not affected by a compromise or novation of contract. The crime of Estefa, reimbursement, or belated payment to the offended party of the money swindled by the accused does not extinguish the criminal liability of the latter. Also, criminal liability for Estefa is not affected by compromise or novation of contract, for it is a public offense which must be prosecuted and punished by the government on its own motion even though complete reparation should have been made of the damage suffered by the offended party. In Estefa, reimbursement of or compromise as to the amount misappropriated after the commission of the crime affects only the civil liability of the offender, and not his criminal liability, Metropolitan Bank and Trust Company v. Rogelio Reynaldo and Jose C. Adrandia. Effect of acquittal or the extinction of the penal action on the civil action or civil liability. Number 1. The extinction of the penal action does not carry with it the extinction of the civil action. However, the civil action based on delict may be deemed extinguished if there is a finding in a final judgment in the criminal action that the act or omission from which the civil liability may arise did not exist. Section 2, Rule 111. The civil action based on delict may, however, be deemed extinguished if there is a finding on the final judgment in the criminal action that the act or omission from which the civil liability may arise did not exist. Hun Young Park v. Young Wang Choi. Number 2. In case of acquittal, the accused may still be adjudged civilly liable. The extinction of the penal action does not carry with it the extinction of the civil action where, a, the acquittal is based on reasonable doubt as only preponderance of evidence is required, b, the court declares that the liability of the accused is only civil, and, c, the civil liability of the accused does not arise from or is not based upon the crime of which the accused was acquitted. The civil liability is not extinguished by acquittal where such acquitted is based on lack of proof beyond reasonable doubt, since only preponderance of evidence is required in civil cases, Ching versus Nikbeo. Number 3. Similarly, it was again held that when the trial court acquits the accused or dismisses the case on the ground of lack of evidence to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt, the civil action is not automatically extinguished since liability under such an action can be determined based on mere preponderance of evidence. The offended party may peel off from the terminated criminal action and appeal from the implied dismissal of his claim for civil liability, heirs of Sarah Marie Palma Burgos. Number 4. Thus, under Section 2 of Rule 120, of the Rules of Court, a trial court, in case of acquittal of an accused, is to state whether the prosecution absolutely failed to prove his, accused, guilt or merely failed to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt, and in either case, it shall determine if the act or omission from which the civil liability might arise did not exist. If after a perusal of the decision of the trial court it shows that it found that the acts or omissions from which the civil liability of respondents might arise did not exist, there is no basis to award any civil liability to the private complainants, Ramon Garces v. Simplicio Hernandez, ETAL. Number 5. A more recent case is illustrative of the principal subject of this topic. Here, 
the petitioner was charged with the crime of reckless imprudence resulting in multiple homicide and multiple serious physical injuries with damage to property in the municipal trial court. After trial on the merits, the MTC acquitted petitioner of the crime charged. Petitioner was, however, held civilly liable and was ordered to pay the heirs of the victim's actual damages, civil indemnity for death, moral damages, temperate damages, and loss of earning capacity. Petitioner appealed to the regional trial court contending that the municipal trial court erred in holding him civilly liable in view of his acquittal but the regional trial court affirmed the judgment appealed from in toto. Refusing to give up, petitioner appealed to the court of appeals which rendered a decision affirming the judgment of the regional trial court. Left with no other recourse, petitioner now argued in the Supreme Court that his acquittal should have freed him from payment of civil liability. Emphatically, the court declared, we disagree. The rule is that every person criminally liable is also civilly liable. Criminal liability will give rise to civil liability only if the felonious act or omission results in damage or injury to another and is the direct and proximate cause thereof. Every crime gives rise to, 1, a criminal action for the punishment of the guilty party and, 2, a civil action for the restitution of the thing, repair of the damage, and indemnification for the losses. However, the reverse is not always true. In this connection, the relevant portions of Section 2, Rule 111 and Section 2, Rule 120 of the Rules of Court provide. Section 2. When separate civil action is suspended. The extinction of the penal action does not carry with it extinction of the civil action. However, the civil action based on delict shall be deemed extinguished if there is a finding in a final judgment in the criminal action that the act or omission from which the civil liability may arise did not exist. Section 2. Contents of the judgment. In case the judgment is of acquittal, it shall state whether the evidence of the prosecution absolutely failed to prove the guilt of the accused or merely failed to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. In either case, the judgment shall determine if the act or omission from which the civil liability might arise did not exist, emphasis supplied. Thus, the rule is that the acquittal of an accused of the crime charged will not necessarily extinguish his civil liability, unless the court declares in a final judgment that the fact from which the civil liability might arise did not exist. Courts can acquit an accused on reasonable doubt but still order payment of civil damages in the same case. It is not even necessary that a separate civil action be instituted. In this case, the MTC held that it could not ascertain with moral certainty the wanton and reckless manner by which petitioner drove the bus in view of the condition of the highway where the accident occurred and the short distance between the bus and the taxi before the collision. However, it categorically stated that while petitioner may be acquitted based on reasonable doubt, he may nonetheless be held civilly liable. The RDC added that there was no finding by the MTC that the act from which petitioner's civil liability may arise did not exist. Therefore, the MTC was correct in holding petitioner civilly liable to the heirs of the victims of the collision for the tragedy, mental anguish, and trauma they suffered plus expenses they incurred during the wake and interment. In view of the pronouncements of the MTC and the RDC, we agree with the conclusion of the CA that petitioner was acquitted not because he did not commit the crime charged but because the RDC and the MTC could not ascertain with moral conviction the wanton and reckless manner by which petitioner drove the bus at the time of the accident. Put differently, petitioner was acquitted because the prosecution failed to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. However, his civil liability for the death, injuries, and damages arising from the collision is another matter. While petitioner was absolved from criminal liability because his negligence was not proven beyond reasonable doubt, he can still be held civilly liable if his negligence was established by preponderance of evidence. In other words, the failure of the evidence to prove negligence with moral certainty does not negate, and is in fact compatible with, a ruling that there was preponderant evidence of such negligence. And that is sufficient to hold him civilly liable. Thus, the MTC, as affirmed by the RDC and the CA, correctly imposed civil liability on petitioner despite his acquittal. Simple logic also dictates that petitioner would not have been held civilly liable if his act from which the civil liability had arisen did not in fact exist, Romero vs. People. Subscribe for more audiobook like this. Effect of Payment of the Civil Liability Payment of civil liability does not extinguish criminal liability, Cabello vs. Demaculang and Quiridro. While there may be a compromise upon the civil liability arising from the offense, such compromise shall not extinguish the public action for the imposition of the legal penalty, Article 2034, Civil Code. Effect of judgment in the civil case absolving the defendant. A final judgment rendered in a civil action absolving a defendant from civil liability is not a bar to a criminal action against the defendant for the same act or omission subject of the civil action, Section 5, Rule 111. Subsidiary Liability of Employer. The provisions of the revised penal code on subsidiary liability are deemed written into the judgments in cases to which they apply. Thus, in the dispositive portion of its decision, the trial court need not expressly pronounce the subsidiary liability of the employer. Nonetheless, before the employer's subsidiary liability is enforced, adequate evidence must exist establishing that, 1, they are indeed the employers of the convicted employees, 2, they are engaged in some kind of industry, 
3. The crime was committed by the employees in the discharge of their duties, and, 4. The execution against the latter has not been satisfied due to insolvency. These conditions may be determined in the same criminal action in which the employee's liability, criminal and civil, has been pronounced, in a hearing set for that precise purpose, with due notice to the employer, as part of the proceedings for the execution of the judgment, Rolito Callan and Filtronco Service Enterprises Incorporated vs. People. Concept of a Prejudicial Question, Bar 1999. Number 1. A prejudicial question is an issue involved in a civil case which is similar or intimately related to the issue raised in the criminal action, the resolution of which determines whether or not the criminal action may proceed. To constitute a prejudicial question, the rule also requires, aside from the related issues, that the civil action be instituted previously or ahead of the criminal action, Section 7, Rule 111. Number 2. A prejudicial question is that which arises in a case, the resolution of which is a logical antecedent of the issue involved in that case. Because the jurisdiction to try and resolve the prejudicial question has been lodged in another tribunal, the applicable rule is that the proceedings in the second case may be suspended to await the resolution of the prejudicial question in the first case, suggested readings, Omicteen v. Court of Appeals. Reason for the principle. The reason behind the principle of a prejudicial question is to avoid two conflicting decisions in the civil case and in the criminal case, Jose v. Suarez, S.Y. Thiongsu v. S.Y. Chim. Requisites for a prejudicial question, Bar 1999. Number 1. Section 7 of Rule 111 of the Rules of Court provides. Section 7. Elements of a prejudicial question. The elements of a prejudicial question are, a. The previously instituted civil action involves an issue similar or intimately related to the issue raised in the subsequent criminal action, and, b. The resolution of such issue determines whether or not the criminal action may proceed, Jose v. Suarez. Thus, for a civil action to be considered prejudicial to a criminal case, the following requisites must be present, 1. The civil case involves facts intimately related to those upon which the criminal prosecution would be based, 2. In the resolution of the issue or issues raised in the civil action, the guilt or innocence of the accused would necessarily be determined, and, 3. Jurisdiction to try said question must be lodged in another tribunal, magistrado versus people. Number 2. The phraseology of section 7 presupposes the existence of two actions one civil and the other criminal. Hence, strictly speaking, a prejudicial question under Section 7 of Rule 111 may not be invoked in any of the following situations, a. Both cases are criminal, b. Both civil, c. Both cases are administrative, d. One case is administrative and the other civil, or, e. One case is administrative and the other criminal. To employ the word prejudicial in any of these situations is to use the same not as a strict legal term but as a mere journalistic device. Number 3. The same phraseology of Section 7 also discloses that even if one case is civil and the other criminal, the principle of a prejudicial question will not arise if the criminal case was instituted prior to the civil case. It does not arise because the rule does not merely refer to an instituted civil action but specifically to a previously instituted asterisk civil action. Neither does it refer to a previously instituted criminal action. That the civil action must have been instituted ahead of the criminal action is confirmed by the same rule which makes reference to a subsequent criminal action. Number 4. It was affirmed that under the amendment to the rules of court, a prejudicial question is understood in law as that which must precede the criminal action and which requires a decision before a final judgment can be rendered in the criminal action with which said question is closely connected. The civil action must be instituted prior to the institution of the criminal action. If the criminal information was filed ahead of the complaint in the civil case, no prejudicial question exists, Torres v. Garkaitarina. Number 5. The tenor of Section 7 likewise presupposes that the issue that leads to a prejudicial question is one that arises in the civil case and not in the criminal case. It is the issue in the civil case which needs to be resolved first before it is determined whether or not the criminal case should proceed or whether or not there should be, in the criminal case, a judgment of acquittal or conviction. 6. In unmistakable terms, it was stressed that a prejudicial question comes into play generally in a situation where a civil action and a criminal action are both pending and there exists in the former an issue which must be preemptively resolved before the criminal action may proceed. The issue raised in the civil action would be determinative juris et de jure of the guilt or innocence of the accused in the criminal case, S.Y. Thiongsu vs. S.Y. Chim. 7. Another vital element of a prejudicial question is one which has something to do with the issues involved. It is worth remarking that not every issue raised in the civil action will result in a prejudicial question. The rule clearly implies that it is not enough that both cases involve the same facts or even the same or similar issues to make the civil case prejudicial to the criminal case. The mere claim that the issues in both cases are intimately related will not necessarily make the issue in the civil case prejudicial to the resolution of the issue in the criminal case. It is critical to show that the issue in the civil case is determinative of the issue in the criminal case. In the words of the rule, XXX the resolution of such issue determines whether or not the criminal action may proceed, 
Section 7, Rule 111. It is apparent that the exact parameters of what is determinative asterisk has not been defined by the rule thus, leaving to the court the task of adjudicating upon the existence or non-existence of that vital factor in the application of the principle. Nevertheless, one consequence appears quite clear, if the resolution of the issue in the civil action will not determine the criminal responsibility of the accused in the criminal action based on the same facts, the civil case does not involve a prejudicial question. Neither is there a prejudicial question if the civil and the criminal action can, according to law, proceed independently of each other, that is, the criminal action can proceed without waiting for the resolution of the issues in the civil case. Effect of the existence of a prejudicial question, suspension of the criminal action, bar 1995, 1999, 2010. Number 1. A petition for the suspension of the criminal action based upon the pendency of a prejudicial question in a civil action may be filed, Section 6, Rule 111. Under the clear terms of Section 6, it is worth remembering that the rule requires the filing of a petition before the suspension of the criminal action. The rule therefore, as it appears, precludes a motu proprio suspension of the criminal action. Number 2. The need for the filing of a petition finds support in jurisprudence which declares that since suspension of the proceedings in the criminal action may be made only upon petition and not at the instance of the judge or the investigating prosecutor, the latter cannot take cognizance of a claim of a prejudicial question without a petition to suspend being filed. Since a petition to suspend can be filed only in the criminal action, the determination of the pendency of a prejudicial question should be made at the first instance in the criminal action, and not before the Supreme Court in an appeal from the civil action, Integrated Bar of the Philippines v. Atienza. Number 3. It also needs to be stressed that when there is a prejudicial question, the action to be suspended is the criminal and not the previously instituted civil action. When there is a prejudicial question, the criminal case may be suspended pending the final determination of the issues in the civil case. A prejudicial question accords a civil case a preferential treatment and constitutes an exception to the general rule that the civil action shall be suspended when the criminal action is instituted. The general rule provides that if the civil action was commenced before the institution of the criminal action, the civil action shall be suspended in whatever stage it may be found before judgment on the merits, once the criminal action is commenced. The suspension shall last until final judgment is rendered in the criminal action. A prejudicial question is an exception to this rule. The principle of prejudicial question is not within the ambit of this general rule under Section 2 of Rule 111. Suspension does not include dismissal. The rule authorizing the suspension of the criminal case does not prescribe the dismissal of the criminal action. It only authorizes its suspension. The suspension shall be made upon the filing of a petition for suspension. A case was emphatic in reiterating this principle. The case of Yap versus Paras, stressed that the rule says suspension, and not dismissal. Where to file the petition for suspension? Number 1. The filing for a petition for suspension does not require that the criminal case be already filed in court. It is sufficient that the case be in the stage of preliminary investigation as long as there has already been a previously instituted civil case. Also, the petition for suspension is not to be filed in the civil case but in the criminal case. Number 2. The rule provides therefore, that a petition for the suspension of the criminal action may be filed in the office of the prosecutor conducting the preliminary investigation. When the criminal action has been filed in court for trial, the petition to suspend shall be filed in the same criminal action at any time before the prosecution rests, Section 6, Rule 111. Subscribe for more audiobook like this. Case Illustrations Number 1. The case Oi Pimental vs. Pimental, lucidly illustrates when the principle of prejudicial question does not apply. Here, the private respondent filed an action for frustrated parricide against the petitioner. Several months after, the private respondent filed an action for the declaration of the nullity of their marriage. The petitioner filed an urgent motion to suspend the proceedings in the court where the criminal case was pending on the ground of the existence of a prejudicial question. The petitioner asserted that since the relationship between the offender and the victim is a key element in Perry's side, the outcome of the civil case would have a bearing in the criminal case filed against him. When the case reached the Court of Appeals, the court concluded against the existence of a prejudicial question. The Court of Appeals ruled that in the criminal case for frustrated Perry's side, the issue is whether the offender commenced the commission of the crime of parricide directly by overt acts and did not perform all the acts of execution by reason of some cause or accident other than his own spontaneous desistance. On the other hand, the issue in the civil action for annulment of marriage is whether petitioner is psychologically incapacitated to comply with the essential marital obligations. The Court of Appeals continued that even if the marriage between petitioner and respondent would be declared void, it would be immaterial to the criminal case because prior to the declaration of nullity, the alleged acts constituting the crime of frustrated parricide had already been committed and all that is required for the charge of frustrated parricide is that at the time of the commission of the crime, the marriage is still subsisting. The Supreme Court sustained the conclusion of the Court of Appeals with an added reason that the facts show that the criminal case was filed ahead of the case for declaration of nullity. The rule is clear, wrote the court, 
that for a prejudicial question to exist, the civil action must be instituted first before the filing of the criminal action. As such, the requirement of Section 7, Rule 111 of the 2000 Rules on Criminal Procedure was not met since the civil action was filed subsequent to the filing of the criminal action. The court added that the resolution of the civil action is not a prejudicial question that would warrant the suspension of the criminal action. While the relationship between the offender and the victim is a key element in the crime of parricide, the issue in the annulment of marriage is not similar or intimately related to the issue in the criminal case for parricide. The issue in the civil case for annulment of marriage under Article 36 of the Family Code is whether petitioner is psychologically incapacitated to comply with the essential marital obligations. The issue in parricide is whether the accused killed the victim. In this case, since petitioner was charged with frustrated parricide, the issue is whether he performed all the acts of execution which would have killed respondent as a consequence but which, nevertheless, did not produce it by reason of causes independent of petitioner's will. At the time of the commission of the alleged crime, petitioner and respondent were married. The subsequent dissolution of their marriage, in case the petition in the civil case is granted will have no effect on the alleged crime that was committed at the time of the subsistence of the marriage. In short, even if the marriage between petitioner and respondent is annulled, petitioner could still be held criminally liable since at the time of the commission of the alleged crime, he was still married to respondent. Number 2. The case of Magistrato vs. People, is likewise illuminating. Here, the private respondent filed a criminal complaint for perjury against the petitioner for executing an affidavit of loss of a certificate of title of a parcel of land despite allegedly knowing that no loss of the certificate occurred because the petitioner had actually delivered the same to the private respondent as security for a loan which the petitioner contracted from the private respondent. After an information for perjury against the petitioner was instituted, he filed a motion for suspension of the proceedings based on a prejudicial question. He alleged that a case filed against him by the private respondent for recovery of a sum of money is pending before another court. He further alleged that another civil case is also pending before another branch of the same court when he filed against private respondent a complaint for cancellation of mortgage, delivery of title and damages. The issues in the said civil cases according to petitioner are similar or intimately related to the issues raised in the criminal action. As to whether it was proper to suspend the criminal case in view of the pending civil cases, the Supreme Court observed that the pending civil cases are principally for the determination of whether a loan was obtained by the petitioner from the private respondent and whether petitioner executed a real estate mortgage in favor of the private respondent. On the other hand, the criminal case involves the determination of whether petitioner committed perjury in executing an affidavit of loss to support his request for issuance of a new owner's duplicate copy of the certificate of title. The court went on to hold that it is evident that the civil cases and the criminal case can proceed independently of each other. Regardless of the outcome of the two civil cases, it will not establish the innocence or guilt of the petitioner in the criminal case for perjury. The purchase by petitioner of the land or his execution of a real estate mortgage will have no bearing whatsoever on whether petitioner knowingly and fraudulently executed a false affidavit of loss. Number 3. Another case on the other hand, demonstrates the application of the concept of determinativeness as a critical element under the principle of prejudicial question. In Omicteen versus Court of Appeals, the petitioner, operations manager of a corporation filed a complaint for two counts of estifa against the private respondent. He alleged that the private respondent, despite repeated demands, refused to return the two company vehicles entrusted to him when he was still the president of the corporation. The private respondent averse that the demands are not valid demands, the petitioner not having the authority to act for the corporation in view of the invalidity of his appointment. The investigating prosecutor however, recommended the indictment of the private respondent and was charged with the crime of estifa. The private respondent then filed a motion to suspend proceedings on the basis of a prejudicial question because of the then pending case with the Securities and Exchange Commission, later transferred to the RDC, a case involving the same parties. It appears that earlier, the private respondent filed a case for the declaration of nullity of the respective appointments of the petitioner and other individuals as corporate officers. The case likewise involved the recovery of share in the profits, involuntary dissolution and the appointment of a receiver, recovery of damages and an application for a temporary restraining order and injunction against the corporation and some of its officials. The case filed by the private respondent also alleged that the appointment of certain officers were invalid because it was in derogation of the corporate bylaws requiring that the president must be chosen from among the directors, and elected by the affirmative vote of a majority of all the members of the board of directors. Since the appointment of the officer responsible for appointing the petitioner was invalid, the petitioner's appointment as operations manager was likewise allegedly invalid. Thus, private respondent claims, the petitioner neither has the power nor the authority to represent or act for the corporation in any transaction or action before any court of justice. Citing as a reason the absence of a board resolution authorizing the continued operations of the corporation as a corporate entity, the private respondent allegedly retained possession of the office equipment of the company in a fiduciary capacity as director of the corporation pending its dissolution and slash or the resolution of the intracorporate dispute. 
on the issue of whether or not a prejudicial question exists to warrant the suspension of the criminal proceedings pending the resolution of the intracorporate controversy in the RDC, the court sustained the theory of the private respondent that the resolution of the issues raised in the intracorporate dispute will determine the guilt or innocence of private respondent in the crime of Estefa filed against him by the petitioner. One of the elements of the crime of Estefa with abuse of confidence under Article 315, paragraph 1, b, of the revised penal code is a demand made by the offended party to the offender. Under the circumstances, since the alleged offended party is the corporation, the validity of the demand for the delivery of the subject vehicles rests upon the authority of the person making such a demand on the company's behalf. In the civil cases, the private respondent was challenging the petitioner's authority to act for the corporation in the corporate case pending before the RDC. Taken in this light, added the court, if the supposed authority of petitioner is found to be defective, it is as if no demand was ever made, hence, the prosecution for Estefa cannot prosper. Number 4. BP-22 controversies present a special class of cases with remarkably consistent rulings against the appreciation of a prejudicial question. One case worthy of note and which demonstrates an absence of a prejudicial question is Yap versus Cabals. Here, the petitioner issued bouncing checks to the payee which were later rediscointed in favor of private respondents. When the checks were dishonored, the private respondents then filed civil actions to collect sums of money with damages against the petitioner in the RDC. Subsequently informations were also filed against the petitioner for violation of BP-22. In the criminal cases, petitioner filed separate motions to suspend proceedings on account of the existence of a prejudicial question. Petitioner prayed that the proceedings in the criminal cases be suspended until the civil cases pending before the RDC were finally resolved. The main contention of the petitioner is that a prejudicial question, as defined by law and jurisprudence, exists because the civil cases for collection earlier filed against him for collection of sum of money and damages were filed ahead of the criminal cases for violation of BP-22. He further argued that, in the pending civil cases, the issue as to whether private respondents are entitled to collect from the petitioner despite the lack of consideration, is an issue that is a logical antecedent to the criminal cases for violation of BP-22, for if the court rules that there is no valid consideration for the check's issuance, as petitioner contends, then it necessarily follows that he could not also be held liable for violation of BP-22. The court denied the motions for lack of merit. The subsequent motions for reconsideration were likewise denied. Ruling on the issue on appeal to it, the court explained that triple X the issue in the criminal cases is whether the petitioner is guilty of violating BP-22, while in the civil case, it is whether the private respondents are entitled to collect from the petitioner the sum or the value of the checks that they have rediscounted from the payee. For the court, the resolution of the issue raised in the civil action is not determinative of the guilt or innocence of the accused in the criminal cases against him, and there is no necessity that the civil case be determined first before taking up the criminal cases. Citing the earlier case of Lozano v. Martinez, the court added that in a criminal action for violation of BP-22, it is the mere issuance of worthless checks with knowledge of the insufficiency of funds to support the checks which constitutes the offense. As a consequence, even if the accused is declared not liable for the payment of the value of the checks and damages, he cannot be adjudged free from criminal liability for violation of BP-22. Number 5. Another case similarly decided is that of SBS. Jose v. SBS. Suctres. The respondents who are spouses, are the debtors of the petitioners, also spouses under an agreement which required the respondents to pay a daily interest on their debts but which interest was later on increased. It was the practice for petitioners to give the loaned money to the respondents and the latter would deposit the same in the petitioner's account to cover the maturing postdated checks they had previously issued in payment of their other loans. The respondents would then issue checks in favor of petitioners in payment of the amount borrowed from them with the agreed daily interest. Respondents later filed a complaint against petitioners seeking the declaration of nullity of interest of 5% per day, fixing of interest, recovery of interest payments and the issuance of a writ of preliminary injunction, alleging that the interest rate of 5% a day is iniquitous, contrary to morals, done under vitiated consent and imposed using undue influence by taking improper advantage of their financial distress. They claimed that due to serious liquidity problems, they were forced to rely on borrowings from banks and individual lenders, including petitioners, and that they had to scramble for funds to cover the maturing postdated checks they issued to cover their other borrowings. Thereafter, several cases for violation of BP-22 were filed against one of the respondents who in turn filed motions to suspend the criminal proceedings on the ground of prejudicial question, on the theory that the checks subject of the BP-22 cases are void for being contra bonos mores or for having been issued in payment of the iniquitous and unconscionable interest imposed by petitioners. The suspension order issued by the lower court was later on upheld by the Court of Appeals which concluded that if the checks subject of the criminal cases were later on declared null and void, then said checks could not be made the basis of criminal prosecutions under BP-22. In other words, ruled the Court of Appeals, the outcome of the determination of the validity of the said checks is determinative of guilt or innocence of the accused in the criminal case. The Supreme Court reversed, holding that the prejudicial question theory of the respondents must fail. 
For the court, the prejudicial question posed by respondents is simply whether the daily interest rate of 5% is void, such that the checks issued by respondents to cover said interest are likewise void for being contra bonos moris, and thus the cases for BP22 will no longer prosper. The court stressed that the validity or invalidity of the interest rate is not determinative of the guilt of respondents in the criminal cases because the reason for the issuance of a check is inconsequential in determining criminal culpability under BP-22. What BP-22 punishes is the issuance of a bouncing check and not the purpose for which it was issued or the terms and conditions relating to its issuance. The mere act of issuing a worthless check is malum prohibitum provided the other elements of the offense are properly proved. Thus, whether or not the interest rate imposed by petitioners is eventually declared void for being contra bonos moris will not affect the outcome of the BP-22 cases because what will ultimately be penalized is the mere issuance of bouncing checks. In fact, the primordial question posed before the court hearing the BP-22 cases is whether the law has been breached, that is, if a bouncing check has been issued. 6. A similar result was reached in yet another more recent case, where the High Court rejected respondents' contention that the novation of the credit line agreement was a prejudicial question in the prosecution for violation of BP-22. According to the Court the mere act of issuing a worthless check, even if merely as an accommodation, is covered by BP-22. The agreement surrounding the issuance of dishonor checks is irrelevant to the prosecution for violation of BP-22, the gravamen of the offense being the act of making and issuing a worthless check or a check that is dishonored upon its presentment for payment. Thus, even if it will be subsequently declared that an ovation took place between respondents and petitioner, respondents are still not exempt from prosecution for violation of BP-22 for the dishonored checks, Land Bank of the Philippines v. Ramon P. Jacinto. 7. The earlier case of Sabindal v. Tonko, involves a petition to suspend the criminal proceedings in the court where the petitioner is charged with 11 counts of violations of BP-22 filed in 1992. It appears that three years after the institution of the criminal actions, the petitioner filed with the RDC a complaint against the private respondent a case for specific performance, recovery of overpayment and damages. The issue raised reaching the Supreme Court is whether a prejudicial question exists to warrant the suspension of the trial of the criminal cases for violation of BP-22 against petitioner until after the resolution of the civil action for specific performance, recovery of overpayment, and damages. The court predictably rejected the posturings of the petitioner. There is no prejudicial question wrote the court, because the issue in the criminal cases for violation of BP-22 is whether the accused knowingly issued worthless checks. The issue in the civil action for specific performance, overpayment, and damages is whether the petitioner overpaid his obligations to the private respondent. If, after trial in the civil case, the petitioner is shown to have overpaid respondent, it does not follow, added the court, that he cannot be held liable for the bouncing checks he issued for the mere issuance of worthless checks with knowledge of the insufficiency of funds to support the checks is itself an offense. Note. The Supreme Court in this case did not deal with the matter of the criminal action having been filed ahead of the civil action. The rule at the time the cases were filed did not require a previously instituted civil action. The requirement that the civil case be filed ahead of the criminal case is a result of the amendment of the Rules of Criminal Procedure which took effect on December 1, 2000. 8. The effect of a prejudicial question presents an interesting study when the principle is invoked in marriage relationships. One representative case is that of Marbella Bobies versus Bobies. In 1985, the respondent contracted his first marriage. Without said marriage having been annulled, nullified, or terminated, the same respondent contracted a second marriage with the petitioner. Based on petitioner's complaint affidavit, an information for bigamy was filed against the respondent. Sometime thereafter, respondent initiated a civil action for the judicial declaration of absolute nullity of his first marriage on the ground that it was celebrated without a marriage license. Respondent then filed a motion to suspend the proceedings in the criminal case for bigamy invoking the pending civil case for nullity of the first marriage as a prejudicial question to the criminal case. The trial judge granted the motion to suspend the criminal case. The issue sought to be resolved later in the Supreme Court was whether the subsequent filing of a civil action for declaration of nullity of a previous marriage constitutes a prejudicial question to a criminal case for bigamy. In holding that the civil action for declaration of the nullity of the marriage was not determinative of the issue in the bigamy case, the court placed emphasis on Article 40 of the Family Code which requires a prior judicial declaration of nullity of a previous marriage before a party may remarry. Without a judicial declaration of its nullity, explained the court, the first marriage is presumed to be subsisting. The court found that the respondent was, for all legal intents and purposes, regarded as a married man at the time he contracted his second marriage with petitioner. Against this legal backdrop, observed the court, any decision in the civil action for nullity would not erase the fact that respondent entered into a second marriage during the subsistence of a first marriage. The court then concluded that a decision in the civil case was not essential to the determination of the criminal charge. It is, therefore, not a prejudicial question, Marbella Bobies v. Bobies. A case decided before the family code became effective had a substantially similar holding. Landicha v. Rilova, a frequently cited case, 
held that a party cannot judge by himself the nullity of his first marriage to justify a second marriage before the dissolution of the first marriage and only when the nullity of the marriage is so declared by the courts can it be held as void. 9. An action for a declaration of nullity of marriage is not a prejudicial question to a concubinage case. This was the gist of the holding of the court in one remarkable case. The facts of the case began when the petitioner married his wife in 1973. In 1997, the petitioner filed a petition for nullity of marriage on the ground of psychological incapacity under Article 36 of the Family Code. Alleging that it was petitioner who abandoned the conjugal home and lived with another woman, the wife of the petitioner subsequently filed a criminal complaint for concubinage against petitioner and his paramour. Petitioner then filed a motion to defer the proceedings in the criminal case arguing that the pendency of the petition for declaration of nullity of his marriage based on psychological incapacity is a prejudicial question that should merit the suspension of the criminal case for concubinage filed against him by his wife. Petitioner likewise harped on the possibility that two conflicting decisions might result from the civil case for annulment of marriage and the criminal case for concubinage. The court rejected the contentions of the petitioner when the issue was presented before it for resolution. Unequivocally, the court ruled that the pendency of the case for declaration of nullity of petitioner's marriage is not a prejudicial question to the concubinage case. For a civil case to be considered prejudicial to a criminal action as to cause the suspension of the latter pending the final determination of the civil case, it must appear not only that the said civil case involves the same facts upon which the criminal prosecution would be based, but also that in the resolution of the issue or issues raised in the aforesaid civil action, the guilt or innocence of the accused would necessarily be determined. With regard to petitioner's argument that he could be acquitted of the charge of concubinage should his marriage be declared null and void, suffice it to state that even a subsequent pronouncement that his marriage is void is not a defense, Beltran vs. People. 10. Another interesting case involved a petitioner and a private respondent who were married in 1988. In 1990, while the marriage was still subsisting, the petitioner contracted a second marriage with another woman. When private respondent learned of the marriage, she filed a complaint for bigamy and on the basis of her complaint an information charging bigamy was duly filed. The month before however, the petitioner had already filed an action to annul his marriage with the private respondent on the ground that he was merely forced to marry her, that she concealed her pregnancy by another man at the time of the marriage and that she was incapacitated to perform her essential marital obligations. Subsequently, the private respondent also filed with the Professional Regulation Commission, PRC, for the revocation of engineering licenses of the petitioner and the second woman. Petitioner then filed with the PRC a motion to suspend the administrative proceedings in view of the pendency of the civil action for annulment of his marriage to private respondent and the bigamy case. Although the matters raised had become moot and academic when the Supreme Court finally decided the case because of the termination of the civil case, it nevertheless discussed the matter of prejudicial question and ruled. A that the outcome of the civil case for annulment of marriage had no bearing upon the determination of the petitioner's innocence or guilt in the criminal case for bigamy because all that is required for the charge of bigamy to prosper is that the first marriage be subsisting at the time of the marriage. The prevailing rule is found in Article 40 of the Family Code which requires a prior judicial declaration of nullity before the void character of the first marriage may be invoked. b. The concept of a prejudicial question involves a civil and a criminal case. High filing of a civil case does not necessitate the suspension of the administrative proceedings. There is no prejudicial question where one case is administrative and the other civil, TE versus Court of Appeals. Subscribe for more audiobook like this.